As I grew up and traveled the world, and as I saw more than my share of war and destruction, I came to the hard truth that Captain America isn't coming to the rescue. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Post. Today's guest is a real-life American hero, retired Navy Admiral William McRaven, who 10 years ago next month led the raid on Abbottabad that killed Osama bin Laden. Today, Admiral McRaven is a best-selling author. He has a new book called The Hero Code, Lessons uh, learn from what lives well lived. That's about uh, everyday heroes uh, in, in hospital schools all over our country. We want to welcome uh, Admiral McRaven to Wash Post Live. Good to have you, sir. Hey, great to be here with you, David. Let's start with your with your book, uh, the the Hero Code, and maybe the right first question uh, is to explain what that code is, what you mean by it, uh, and how you walk the reader through it. I've got a copy of the book here, but maybe you'll give us a verbal introduction. Yeah, thanks. You know, the the hero code, as I point out early in the book, I mean, you know, it's not a puzzle. It's, it's not a cipher. It really is a, a moral code or, or a code of conduct, if you will. As I was writing it, of course, I was thinking about the, the military code of conduct. But I also realize that we have kind of had this code in our DNA since the beginning of mankind. It is what started the great migration out of Africa. It is what has led, you know, explorers to cross the, the seas, uh, researchers to do the great work they do. It is these noble qualities. When we think of a hero, the textbook definition is people that we admire for their noble qualities. And I love that definition because I think it accurately portrays what we're looking for. We're looking for you know, the courage and the humility and the sense of sacrifice and the perseverance. This is what we admire in people. So the code is really about the, the qualities, the traits, the virtues of being a hero from these remarkable heroes that I have encountered in my life. Give us an example of a favorite uh, everyday hero of, of yours, as you describe in the book, or just out of your own experience. Yeah, you know, th there were so many to choose from. Frankly, the hardest part about writing the book uh, was trying to identify, you know, the, the heroes that match the virtues in there. But the first one I, I talk about uh, in the first chapter in the book is on courage. And there's a, a quote from Winston Churchill uh, that says something to the effect that the, you know, the greatest or the first of human qualities is courage because it guarantees all the rest. And, uh, and the first story is about uh, Lieutenant Ashley White, uh, Ashley, a, a great soldier uh, who was part of our cultural support teams in Afghanistan. Uh, when we were doing missions and our special operations forces were going on to compounds every night, it was culturally inappropriate for men uh, either Afghan men or American men to be, uh, you know, touching the women, handling them, moving them around. So we needed to find some some great female soldiers that were, you know, physically tough, mentally tough, that could go out with the Rangers and the SEALs. And, and Ashley White was one of the first people to sign up to be part of this cultural support team. And the reason I talk about her courage is, is she, you know, she got on the helicopters every single night every single night to go out on these missions. And I'm telling you, you know, when you are in a combat zone, you're scared most of the time. And anybody that says they're not uh, is probably not telling you the whole story. But you take that fear and you bury it down deep inside of you and you, you cover it with every barricade you can because you know you have to do your job. And let me tell you, that takes courage. And Ashley White did it every single day 
uh, she did her job and she went out with her fellow soldiers and, uh, and she eventually gave her life uh, for those fellow soldiers in Afghanistan when she stepped on a pressure plate mine that killed her and, and two rangers. But the story of courage really is, is more than about one great shining moment. It's also about the courage, as you said, David, of the, the kind of average, if you will, people that you meet in the course of the day, the, the, the parents that are taking care of their kids, the, the coaches that are, are teaching the young athletes, the cops that are on the streets doing their job. I mean, these are just as courageous, uh, just as great qualities, just as heroic uh, as, as some of the great heroes we think of in our lives. Well, we've all uh, lived through a difficult uh, year, uh, not uh, the conditions of combat, but for, for many of our viewers, it's been a tough year. Uh, I read and enjoyed this book, and I'm sure people will find in it a lot uh, to, to take comfort, take heart from. Uh, Admiral McCraven, I want to turn to some of the issues in the, in the news uh, and start with Afghanistan. The president today will make a speech uh, shortly in which he'll formally announce what was put out to the press uh, yesterday, which is that he is going to get the U.S. troops out of Afghanistan by uh, September 11, uh, the 2,500 remaining uh, U.S. troops. I want to ask you, when you heard that news yesterday or whenever you heard the first account of it, what your own feelings were as somebody who's been so deeply involved in that war? Yeah, my, my first question to myself was, you know, how much uh, consultation has the president done uh, with the military leaders. And, and frankly, I reached out to some very close associates of mine, and I was pleased to see uh, that the president has been kind of in constant engagement with General Scott Miller, who was the ISAF commander in Afghanistan, uh, General Frank McKenzie, who was the CENTCOM commander, obviously Chairman Mark Milley and Secretary Austin, all who have extensive experience in Afghanistan. And they had an opportunity to make their case to the administration. And I think what the administration, uh, you know, they came to the assessment that, look, we're not going to have a military victory in Afghanistan. And so maybe we can have a, a political one. And so from the military standpoint, as long as you have an opportunity to have your opinions heard, as long as you have an opportunity to make your case, then at the end of the day, you know, we work for the civilian leaders and we're a professional military. So our job is to do what the civilian leaders ask us to do. And so I was very reassured that the, the military had a, had a great opportunity to engage with the president and have their voices heard. And then the president makes the decision and we, we move out smartly and carry out that decision. One of the uh, values that you cite in your book, The Hero Code, is perseverance. Uh, perseverance in war uh, is obviously essential. We've been persevering in Afghanistan for 20 years. In your own mind, do you think the time has come to end this war, or would you have leaned toward keeping a smaller residual force uh, a while longer to try to protect our interests, uh, protect uh, stability there? Yeah, and uh, you know, I think as I mentioned, David, uh, I'm sure the military commanders had an opportunity to discuss this with the president. And my expectation, while I don't know this for a fact, is that we will have uh, uh, you know, capabilities in place, and whether they are overhead surveillance with drones, uh, we may have a, a, a combat air patrol coming off an aircraft carrier in the Gulf. Uh, you know, we'll still be able to, I think, provide military support in some fashion to the Afghan National Security Forces were they to need it you know, after we leave. You know, we all understand uh, that there are still going to be problems in Afghanistan. Uh, the Taliban are still going to be there. Uh, we don't want to have a recurrence of al-Qaeda safe havens. So uh, I am, I'm pretty confident that the military leaders and our intelligence uh, leaders had a chance to talk to the president and say, look, if we draw down the forces to zero, uh, let's make sure we have some safety measures in place uh, that we're prepared to address some of the, again, the counterterrorism issues or, or the general security issues there in Afghanistan. And, uh, and while I don't know that for a fact, you know, my guess is this is part of the planning. Let me just press you a little bit more on this. You were the head of Special Operations Command. You know this world of counterterrorism as well as anyone. One of the questions that people have been raising in these last several days is whether it's it's going to be possible to have the robust counterterrorism presence without uh, this small residual force. 
for example, you'll want to have drones that can see the ground, that can take a direct action if terrorists begin to rebuild uh, havens. But those drones will have to be based pretty far away, uh, probably as far away as, as, as the Persian Gulf. It's a long flight and not much time over, over target. Does that concern you uh, from a, a, a tactical standpoint, as you, if you will, as somebody who's a veteran of, of, of these counterterrorism fights? Yeah, well, again, I think once we identify what the problem set looks like, so to your point, David, you know, you talk about the drones. I mean, nowadays, of course, the, the drones uh, airtime is, is even significantly more than when I left the military a few years ago. Uh, so you can set up an orbit of drones from you know, just about any place within Southwest Asia there and still be able to have the coverage you need in Afghanistan. So uh, once again, I, I'm confident that the military has thought through this in terms of where would we need to base these assets? You know, what is the flight time? How do you keep the drones in orbit? Do you make sure that they are armed drones? So in the event you see a potential attack on our, our allies uh, in the Afghan security forces, can we address that? Of course, we're also going to need, uh, you know, intelligence assets on the ground. Uh, so my expectation is we will maintain an intelligence network uh, through, through, again, our, our Afghans and other partners that might be there uh, to ensure that we've got pretty good situational awareness of what's happening uh, on the ground and the threat that's uh, being presented. And it would be your judgment as somebody who's who's a, a real specialist in this that real expert that will be able to satisfy the counterterrorism concerns that the country understandably has and will have going forward uh, under the plan that the president has proposed. Yeah, let me say at the outset, this is not without risk. Uh, and, and the president understands that. Uh, you know, we, we learned the lesson of ISIS. Uh, and so I, I think as we go into Afghanistan, the concern about uh, you know, will the Taliban mount uh, a major operation to overthrow the Afghan government? Uh, will there be a rise in, uh, in Al Qaeda in Afghanistan? Uh, all of the sorts of concerns that we think about whenever we're pulling out of a situation like this. I know that the military planners, and again, the folks at CIA and NSA and, and the intelligence uh, community have looked at these issues. And I know that they are thinking about ways to mitigate the risk. Having said that, make no mistake about it, there will be risks. There are always risks out there. Our job in the military now will be to help mitigate those risks. That, that's that's uh, direct and, and helpful. Let me ask you one more qu question about Afghanistan, and it's, it's kind of a personal one, but if you were speaking to the families uh, who've lost uh, sons and daughters in this long war, our longest war, who asked you, uh, Admiral McRaven, what, what were, were my sons and daughters fighting for? What, what, what was this war really about? How would you answer that question? Yeah, you know, the fact of the matter is, David, regardless of how the war ends, regardless of how the war ends, their sacrifice has not been diminished one bit. Their courage hasn't been diminished, their camaraderie, their love of their fellow soldiers, their patriotism has not been diminished one iota concerning how we're going to leave Afghanistan. So I would tell the families, you know, your sons and daughters and, and fathers and brothers and mothers came there more to serve the man on their left and the woman on their right, their comrades, knowing they had a job to do, and you know, some of them gave all, but all of them gave something. And let me tell you, that sacrifice uh, will never, ever be diminished. So thank you for that. And let's turn to the moment uh, for which you're remembered and, and celebrated. Uh, we'll, we'll celebrate the 10th anniversary next month. And that's the raid on Abbottabad that killed Osama uh, bin Laden. I want to ask you what your most vivid memories of that operation are 10, 10 years later. The passage of time dulls some memories and sharpens others. What, what's the thing that you think of first when you, when you think back 10 years ago? Yeah, it's not actually about the night of the mission. I mean, I, I remember the night of the mission well. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of the Navy SEALs 
and, and the Army uh, helicopter pilots and, and back-enders and the intelligence community people. I, I'm incredibly proud of all of them. And I'm incredibly proud of the decision the president made uh, with, uh, with probably only a 50-50 chance that bin Laden was there. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was just honored to be a small part of that. But the memory I have actually isn't from that night. It's from months later when I went to New York City. I'm not sure I fully appreciated uh, the impact of the mission uh, on people that had to live through 9-11. When I made a visit uh, to New York City, I, I think it was uh, you know later that year, uh, maybe November of that year, uh, the New Yorkers just were, uh, were incredibly gracious to me, really appreciative of the work that, uh, that I had done and my guys had done. But I was also quick to point out, look, uh, the mission to get bin Laden was not about the Navy SEALs. It wasn't about the helicopter pilots. It was about the hundreds of thousands of soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, civilians, everybody that contributed to this fight, the fight in Iraq, the fight in Afghanistan, the fight around the world to get them. Uh, you know, we were honored. We, the SEALs, were honored to be, you know, the, the, the tip of the spear on this particular mission. Uh, but make no mistake about it, the, the courage and the bravery of the, the other forces uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps was uh, was just as heroic and just as impressive uh, as as the end game with the Bin Laden raid. I'm sure you've considered the counterfactual. Uh, what if Bin Laden had survived uh, that night, had lived, uh, had had escaped somewhere else? Uh, do you think uh, his time would have been short, or that we might uh, still be dealing with a world where Osama Bin Laden was in in hiding? somewhere as as his number two Ayman Zawahiri supposedly is to, to this day? Yeah, yeah, good question. I think there's kind of two scenarios there. One, if, if we had gone in and somehow he had escaped because we, we thought there might be some underground tunnels uh, coming out of the compound, or the other scenario is if, if we'd gotten there and, and in fact he was not there. Uh, but, but in either case, what we found out, of course, after uh, we got bin Laden and we, we got all the intelligence off the second deck, uh, the second floor of the building, we realized he was still plotting and planning. I think most of us felt that he was just a figurehead at that point in time uh, and that getting him was important so that we could bring justice uh, to the American people and to the people around the world who had been affected by this madman. Um, but I'm not sure we really believed he was actively involved in operations. But uh, the intelligence we pulled off showed that uh, you know he continued to be actively involved. So had we missed him that night, uh, you know, there's there's no telling, uh, you know, what events could have occurred after that. Can you share with us the moment when you called uh, then President Obama and informed him of the re result of your mission? <laughs> well, uh, late in in the mission, I mean, there was a couple couple times. Uh, you know, when uh, when we were about you know 15 or so minutes into the mission. Uh, I received uh, from the ground force commander, uh, for God and country, Geronimo, Geronimo, Geronimo. And Geronimo was the, the code word for bin Laden. Uh, and, and of course, that was passed to uh, Director Leon Panetta, who was director of the CIA, and back to the, the president uh, there in the White House. Um, but candidly, I would offer at that point in time, uh, you know, there was not a lot of hooping and hollering. We still had, uh, we still had guys on the ground. Uh, I still had a mission to complete. Uh, so I, I would offer that, uh, you know, neither at the White House nor at CIA headquarters and certainly not uh, at my little headquarters uh, there in Jalalabad did, uh, did, did we start celebrating. We still had to get these guys back. Um, of course, as we were coming back uh, across the border, uh, by this time, uh, I was in direct communications with the president. And, uh, and, and we at that time had a pretty good idea that it was uh, bin Laden. It, it's said that President Obama's gift to you, or at least one of them, a after this mission was a, a tape measure. Uh, is, is that true? And uh, it, maybe you could just describe a little bit of the, of the effort to establish that this really was Osama bin Laden, uh, one issue being his, his unusual uh, uh, height. Yeah, well, uh, as I said, in, in, the, in the very toward the, the, the tail end of the mission, uh, the president is now on the, the video teleconference with me, with me, much like we're having right here. And he says, uh, well, Bill, do you know whether it's bin Laden or not? I said, sir, I, I don't. I need to go you know, personally ID the remains uh, before I can tell the president of the United States 
that this is Osama bin Laden. And he said, okay, great. And my, uh, my little headquarters was uh, just a few minutes from the airfield. So I drove over to the headquarters. The SEALs were just landing. They brought in the remains in a, in a body bag and without getting too graphic, you know, I, I got down, I, I unzipped the body bag. Obviously he didn't look too good. He'd, uh, he'd taken a couple of rounds. Um, the beard was a little bit shorter, but you know, I, I was pretty certain it was bin Laden. But nonetheless, I, I removed, physically removed the remains from the body bag and uh, I knew that bin Laden was uh, about six foot four. Well, you know, I'm six two and I thought, eh, you know, maybe I ought to check and, uh, you know, I, I could kind of lie down next to him. And, but I thought, you know, that would be maybe a little undignified for a three-star admiral. So I saw young, some young SEAL standing nearby and I said, uh, hey son, how, how tall are you? And he said, uh, well, sir, I'm six two. I said, yeah, yeah good, C come here for a minute. I need to, you know, lie down. And at first he looked at me and he was like, what? But he immediately picked up on what I was doing. He said, got it. So he laid down next to the remains and the remains were a, a couple inches longer. I, I didn't really think much of it. I went back to my headquarters and I got back on the video with the president and the president says, you know, well, what do you think? I said, well, sir, you know, I mean, without DNA, I can't be 100% sure, but, you know, I mean, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's him. And I said, and oh, by the way, uh, you know, I had a young seal lie down next to him and, uh, and the remains were a couple inches longer. And there's a long pause on the other end of the video. And again, it, it had been a very serious night with serious consequences. But the president all, all of a sudden says to me, okay, Bill, let me get this straight. We had $65 million for a helicopter, the one that crashed in the compound, and you didn't have $10 for a tape measure? <laughs> and, and of course it was just, uh, again, part of it was just the, the great timing to lower the pressure. Again, it was a serious night with serious consequences, but it was very helpful for me to all of a sudden kind of take a deep breath. Well, a day or so later, I got back to Washington, D.C. I'm briefing uh, uh, the Hill, and uh, my aide gets a call that the president wants to see me over in the Oval Office. So we head over to the Oval Office. The president uh, meets me and my team. He's very gracious and says, uh, yeah, I got something for you. Reaches behind the president's desk and pulls out a plaque. And on the plaque, there's a, a brass plaque that says, you know, from the president of the United States to Vice Admiral Bill McRaven, if we have $65 million for a helicopter, we ought to have $10 for a tape measure. And on the plaque is a Home Depot tape measure. Uh, and it is something I have uh, of great pride. It's actually uh, off to my, my backside here in my library. The, the SEALs who carried out that uh, raid, uh, Adam McRaven, are obviously American heroes. But uh, I wondered if the celebrity that the SEALs had after that uh, moment of, of triumph was good for them, that maybe they got uh, a, a little uh, too famous for their own good. Do you, do you think that's true? And did you worry in the aftermath that uh, discipline within the SEALs, uh, the command structure might be uh, jeopardized by how public their role had been in this raid? Yeah, well, it was obviously a concern on all our parts. I don't think it unduly affected the discipline of the teams. Uh, but, you know, as the, now by this time, I'm the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, and there were a number of SEALs writing books. And at one point in time, I was having a commander's conference, about 200 of my commanders from generals down to colonels, and they're senior enlisted. And, uh, and one young officer raised his hand and said, you know, what about all these SEALs writing books? Well, I had happened to go to our library and pull out all the books that have been written since 9-11 on special operations, and everybody was writing books. And I said, here's my point. I joined the military because I read a book about, you know, the heroics of uh, commandos during World War II and Vietnam. Uh, I watched the movie The Green Beret with John Wayne, which gave me some motivation to come into special operations. I said, I am completely okay with books and movies, you know, hopefully as long as you portray the, the heroism and the sacrifice of the families, uh, I think that's just fine. And oh, by the way, yeah, it's a little hypocritical of some people to say it's okay for the admirals and the secretaries and the presidents to write books. Oh, but for God's sake, don't let the chief petty officers write books. No, no, that, that's not the way it's going to work, in my opinion. So as long as they went through the process of having the books reviewed, and every book I've done to include the hero code has gone through a Department of Defense review, then I'm okay with it. And I don't think the celebrity... Yes, has it created some problems? Sure, uh, but, but I don't think it, it is certainly not systemic uh, and it is a problem that you know, we have to address all the time. 
uh, not just after the bin Laden raid. Let's talk a little bit about where the country is uh, now. Um, you uh, uh, last fall endorsed uh, then candidate uh, Joe Biden uh, for the 2020 presidential election. I'm going to ask you why you felt the need to do that. At the, at the time you wrote, the world no longer looks up to America. And I'm, I'm wondering whether a few months into the Biden presidency, you feel that's beginning to change. Yeah, well, I absolutely feel it, it's beginning to change. Uh, but in that article, uh, I made it clear, David, that, that I am a conservative. I mean, I, I'm a pro-life guy. I, I raised in Texas. I've probably got more guns than any one person ought to have. I, I believe in the Second Amendment. Uh, I believe in a strong defense and a, and a small government. But I also said in there, look, I also support the fact that black lives matter. I'm the biggest believer in the First Amendment you're ever going to meet. I was a journalism major. So uh, you know, I, I think you can be this uh, kind of compassionate conservative, if you, if, you want, if you will. What I was concerned about was that I didn't see the noble qualities uh, in, in the president. Uh, you know, every country, I think, needs, you know, the best leader we can find. We need a, a leader that has character, has integrity, uh, that will step up when the times are tough and do the right thing. And I just didn't see that uh, with, with President Trump. I am seeing, you know, a return to, you know, presidential dignity uh, with President Biden. Uh, I like what he's done in his first hundred days. It will not be easy. It is never easy. As I've said before, you know, I had the, the great pleasure and the great honor of working for both uh, uh, George Bush and Barack Obama. And I didn't agree with either man on a lot of issues, but both of them were men that I trusted, that I thought were doing the right thing for the country. Uh, they were both men of, of great character and integrity. Um, and, and I can follow people like that if I feel like they have put the country's interest uh, you know, first and foremost. And, and I certainly see that President Biden uh, is doing that, uh, certainly in the first uh, you know, uh, months of his, uh, of his presidency. One thing that uh, I think many Americans felt uh, on January 6th, watching the events, the storming uh, of the Capitol, w was that the country really had been damaged by the events during and after the, the 2020 election campaign. I'm wondering if you feel those divisions are beginning to heal and whether we're on the way to being one country again, or whether you're still concerned that uh, what we all saw on our television screens may be deeper in our body politic and may need more attention uh, than we sometimes think. Yeah, you know, what I'd offer is, you know, anything good is worth fighting for. And we are fighting for our democracy. And we will always be fighting for our democracy. Uh, the day we decide to give up on it is the day that we are on the downward slope. But I don't see that at all. Uh, you know, I've said it before. I'm the biggest fan of the millennials and the Gen Z that you'll ever meet. This idea that this generation are some, you know, uh, soft, entitled little snowflakes. Well, I'm quick to point out that you've never seen them in a firefight in Afghanistan or going to school to try to make a better life for themselves or their families. And so whenever I lose a little bit of, uh, of hope. Uh, all I've got to do is look at this new generation. Uh, and they're not like my generation. In many ways, they are a lot better. They really care about their friends. Uh, they, they ask the hard questions. They want answers. They mobilize when they see things that they don't like. Uh, so as rough a time as this may be, I've got great faith and great optimism in these young men and women so uh, are we going to have to fight for our democracy? You're damn right we are. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Let me close with a question that I, I bet you're asked uh, uh, from time to time to time. You know a lot about leadership. You've been a, a leader in very stressful situations. Uh, as you just said, you've thought deeply about the country and where it's going. Would you ever consider running for public office? Yeah, I don't see politics in my future. I actually have, you know, great respect for the, the men and women that step up to do this. Uh, you know, of course, I, I don't agree with all of them. Uh, I have some, uh, some differences of opinion on a whole lot of issues. 
But I'll tell you where I really saw it was when I came back to Texas and I had an opportunity to work with the state legislature. And again, do I have differences with some of the leaders in Texas? Of course I do. But what I saw particularly was the, the representatives and the state senators working to solve the problems. And the problems are solved locally. I mean, we talk about democracy, we talk about infrastructure, we talk about a lot of the issues today, policing. This is solved locally. And so where we have to really hope we find our heroes are in the, the principals in the school and the superintendents of the independent school districts and the representatives and the senators and, at the state level and the mayors and the city council people and the police chiefs. Uh, this is where I think the real work of America gets done. And, and the federal government has got to give them the latitude to do the job, give them the resources to do the job. And then we as Americans have to continue to work with our local representatives and our, our state and, uh, and, and federal representatives as well. But let me tell you, so much of this happens at the grassroots. Uh, and I was pleased to see, again, how many, I hate to keep using this word, but how many heroes there were uh, at the, the local and state level that got our infrastructure built, that took care of our kids in school, uh, that balanced the budget. Um, I said, I, I'm an optimist and I think we're gonna be just fine. So uh, Admiral Bill McRaven, uh, nearly 10 years after the raid on, on Abbottabad. Thanks for joining us. The book is is The Hero Code. Uh, you've heard a good uh, summary uh, of the, the, the spirit that motivates it. Uh, Admiral McRaven, thanks for joining Washington Post Live today. Thank you, David. So uh, folks, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll have a special program at one o'clock today on diversity in the workplace. And at three o'clock, we'll have an Oscar spotlight uh, on uh, the documentary Collective. So have a good day, stay with us. Thanks for joining Washington Post Live.